Well, Hunter Biden's getting another look by the feds. A California grand jury has now dropped nine charges on him for failing to pay his taxes and misleading the United States government about all the money that he owed. He owed millions of dollars, at least $1.4 million in cash uh, to the feds. And it's all laid out here in detail. He classified a bunch of his um, entertainment expenses, to put it mildly, as business expenses. And that's detailed throughout this very long court filing uh, released yesterday afternoon. For more on this, I want to bring in Tristan Levitt now. He's the president of Empower Oversight and the attorney for IRS whistleblowers Gary Shapley and Joseph Ziegler, without whom this indictment would have never happened. I don't think that's up for dispute. Tristan, great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me, Vince. How, uh, how important was the whistleblower testimony, your clients, to this indictment actually coming to fruition? I would say it would not have happened at all were it not for them. They, um, I don't know if you saw, they released a statement last night and noted that, you know, were it, this was a complete vindication of their investigation. And, you know, what they, what they didn't say in their statement is this simply would not have happened. This case was dead at the beginning of the year, not because they politically pressured anybody to make it happen, but because the U.S. attorney in charge of the case, David Weiss, did two complete 180s. Two years ago, they were ready to, they could have issued this exact, exact indictment two years ago at the beginning of 2022. The IRS recommended these charges. DOJ approved these charges. David Weiss approved these charges. And then after a series of interactions that he was required to have with Biden appointees, uh, both at Justice Department headquarters and then at various U.S. attorney's offices, he, he reached the point where by the beginning of this year, he was going to bring no charges whatsoever. And in fact, they offered a, you know, a plea agreement that would have required no charges. That was before they they scaled that back to the one that the public saw that required very minimal charges. So again, if, had they not come forward, had they not had the courage, I just think none of these events would have transpired this year and yes. the public would know nothing. I, I do see that there are defenders of the Biden family uh, right now who are claiming that the only reason that Hunter Biden's receiving this scrutiny is because he's a Biden, he's being treated unfairly. But correct me if I'm wrong, didn't Joe Biden say that tax cheats who make more than $400,000 deserve to be scrutinized by the IRS? Yes, I understand that is correct. Yeah, I think that is. And, and we're talking a guy who made millions of dollars, and we're not really, in this, this charge, in your view, it doesn't really examine the legitimacy of Hunter's business. It doesn't, it doesn't get into what it is that he was really selling and, and uh, whether or not he was committing other crimes on behalf of foreign governments or, or foreign nationals. It's only about uh, whether he failed to pay his taxes, which apparently he did, right? Yeah, that's right. So it's all about what he did with the money, not how he got the money. Now, we, you know, we don't know that there aren't other un investigations ongoing. Um, it was never necessarily the idea that these would be all together, you know, even if they were to charge on FARA, uh, the Foreign Agents Registration Act or something else. Um, you know, those would those would not have necessarily all been in the same indictments. So we don't know if there's more out there, but this doesn't get into that at all. That said, it does touch on, for instance, the payments that he see, received from Ukrainian energy company Burisma um, and lays those out, which, of course, the Justice Department can only reference in this indictment, not charge independently on because they allowed those that income from 2014 and 2015, which would have had to be uh, charge for him not paying taxes on that in the District of Columbia. And David Weiss allowed those, the statute of limitations on that to expire before. But nevertheless, what is in here, what they can charge on is clearly a strong case. And so, again, the fact that earlier this year they were going to let him off with a slap on the hand and that some out there, defenders of the Bidens, were claiming, well, there's nothing to this. He, he did nothing wrong. It was very minimal. This is the proper punishment for it. Anyone that reads this indictment will see that that is not the case. This is very explicit in its detail about all of the crimes he committed and how multiple felonies is exactly the just penalty for him. Right. And if the if you have an American who stiffs, uh, you know, the taxpayers, one point four million dollars, that does seem like the kind of high priority target that IRS investigators would want to go after. Right there. We're talking a lot of money that should be that the, the taxpayers should be able to recoup. Yeah, without question, without question. And that's what motivated these whistleblowers, right? These are not political guys. Of course, one of them is a is a fairly progressive Democrat. One leans slightly to the right. 
Um, you know, and but for them, it was just all about equal treatment. Like, this is what we're taught to do in our investigations. This is what we've done in all of our investigations for over 10 years. Yes. Um, you know, each of them has more than that. And and this was treated differently. And that to them was was the real crux of the issue as to why they needed to come forward. Do you think that this indictment is going to jeopardize getting any useful information out of Hunter Biden in congressional proceedings next week? If if that if that happens at all, but he was expected to appear before Congress in a deposition on October 13th, uh, I'd, I'd imagine that now he'd have further basis to just plead the fifth if he shows up at all. Well, there's a few things to keep in mind there. First of all, he could have pled the fifth anyway. The, the criminal liability here that was looming was real, and his attorneys know that well after Delaware and all the drama that ensued there. So I think it was very likely it would have been a possibility no matter what form or venue he was in with Congress. Second, keep in mind, his attorneys had just said I think it was just yesterday. It's been it's been quite a week, but either yesterday or the day before that he was not going to come for that deposition, that they simply insisted that he would only come to a public hearing. So uh-huh. there wouldn't have been that anyway. And again, if he were to be there, I think the, the information they would get from him in any venue would be of limited use. What they really you know, the real question is, will they will they pursue that? Will they pursue contempt charges against him? But this does help him uh, in a PR sense, you know, to, to make the public more sympathetic to the idea that, uh, you know, that because he's being charged, that it's maybe not fair that he should be questioned by Congress or, you know, for people to identify with him pleading the fifth. Well, also, I can see what's going to happen. I mean, I haven't I haven't read enough of the coverage today to identify if it has, but my guess is it has, which is uh, quite a few people pointing at this and going, see, the Justice Department, it doesn't play favorites here. They went after Hunter Biden, even. He's the son of the president of the United States. Everything is fine at the Justice Department. Everything's fine at the IRS. I imagine uh, the clients that you represent think things are a little different. Well, no question. And and obviously they've been saying that for going on eight, nine months now. But I think for what this indictment does for any member of the public is to say everything's just fine. If there had been no plea deal, if these guys had come forward and it was just radio silence at the Department of Justice, that's a black box. And we might never know. Someone could say, well, they were working on this indictment all that time. But the fact that there was this plea deal that fell apart really puts the lie to that. You you can't say everything. There's no way you can hold at the same time the plea deal that was so light along with this indictment and say these are for the same defendant here. Right. So either either one way or the other, the Justice Department screwed up. Either this indictment is a total unfair targeting of Hunter Biden and, you know, is, is overly excessive or if you read what's in it and it seems compelling, and I would encourage Americans to do that, then you have to ask, why on earth would they have offered this sweetheart plea deal earlier in the year? Because they are just not compatible with one another. Yeah, there's, there's, I was citing something that, you know, they, they actually put all the line items in here. And this, of course, are the things that your clients were looking at in the first place when they were investigating Hunter Biden within the IRS. Uh, and uh, one thing that really jumps off the page of me, the single biggest line item, $1.6 million over the course of four years of ATM and cash withdrawals uh, by Hunter Biden, $1.6 million. I don't even know how, I don't, I'm not even certain I could keep pace with an ATM machine's daily limits to get to $1.6 million over four years. Uh, and yeah. d- is this the kind of thing in your view that deserves greater scrutiny? Yeah, these are the sorts of things. I mean, that's these are the sorts of things that get you suspicious activity reports from banks, right? Uh, Chairman Comer of the House Oversight Committee recently released a number of those uh, reports that had come and how there were worries about money laundering and other things. And so this is precisely the sort of thing that attracts scrutiny. It's precisely the sort of thing the IRS should investigate. And I would say that this indictment is not just a vindication of the whistleblower's claims, but of their excellent investigative ability that they took, you know, some warning signs like that and we're able to really unravel some, you know, a lot of these financial transactions with a lot of shell companies. Hunter had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of different interests and claimed yes. all these things as loans. And so, you know, this indictment was practically written for the prosecutors by the IRS investigative team, given the facts that they uncovered. And, and uh, you mentioned Burisma, the Ukrainian energy company that, that Hunter Biden was making a million dollars a year from. Uh, it was interesting that in this indictment, they reveal that his pay was slashed in half after Joe Biden left office, that he that uh, they went down to half a million dollars per year after that. Uh, that seems like kind of a big indicator deserving of more scrutiny as well. No, no question. And, it, and it's still, of course, one of the questions that still lingers out there separate from even fair charges or anything else is 
the questions that were made in the FBI 1023 or the allegations that were raised by that confidential source, uh, which these in, uh, IRS investigators were not informed of at the time that that 1023 was written by the FBI in the fall of 2020, but that contained the allegations that not only Hunter Biden, but Joe Biden were each paid $5 million by Burisma as a bribe for the firing of Ukrainian prosecutor Viktor Shokin. So this, this touch, again, there's more of these warning signs, there's these indicators, but as far as we know, criminal investigators have never run that down to find out the truth of it because the prosecutors in Delaware just didn't want to hear it, didn't want to look into it. Uh, now, I know your clients just met with Congress, what was it, a week ago, behind closed doors again, provided more documents? Yeah, Tuesday. So we hope that the transcript of that might actually become available this evening, if not, maybe this weekend. Okay. And will, uh, do they have any, I mean, I'm so grateful that they are meeting with Congress and sharing all of this. Uh, do they intend to do that again in the near term, or is this just, is this a big tranche of information and sort of the last we'll hear from your clients for a while? I, I think there was a hope that this was their chance to really get out anything else they wanted to say. <clears throat> so there had been several, both after the, the you know, the main hearing, <clears throat> pardon me, that they'd spoken at before was before the House Oversight Committee, and there were a number of questions that were asked there that they weren't able to answer because of the taxpayer privacy laws, which only allow that information to be provided to the Ways and Means Committee. Right. So this was a, an opportunity for that. And additionally, even the members of the Ways and Means Committee, the last time the whistleblowers provided a tranche of documents, which were voted on in late September, the transcript of that proceeding showed that a lot of Democrats on the committee had questions about the documents that were being provided. So this was really their chance to get everything off their shoulders that they wanted to, and they provided um, some additional documents. Those have been released already by the committee, yes. such as the log of emails uh, between uh, then-Vice President Joe Biden and Eric Schwerin, who was Hunter Biden's business partner, as well as the information that uh, Kevin Morris, the Hollywood attorney, was, has paid $4.9 in Hunter Biden's not just taxes but other personal bills over the last couple of years, which is – you know, they have flagged. And in fact, one of the things that's in the transcript that has not yet come out, but has been voted. So I'm able to share is that Joe Ziegler, this case agent revealed at the end of the hearing that they strongly believed that Mr. Morris was um, was doing this on behalf of the campaign, that this was all a large um, campaign effort to ensure that those bills were paid off so that it didn't interfere with Joe Biden's primary, because it all came, you know, he started paying those bills two months, less than two months after meeting Hunter Biden, and suddenly these very large amounts, he's paying these things off. And one of the emails that was released the other day was Morris writing to his associates, we need to pay these off for great risk personally and politically. And as the whistleblowers pointed out, there was no personal risk to anybody other than candidate Joe Biden. So so if he's doing that, if, if uh, it was ruled to be a campaign contribution, it would be, I would presume, uh, kind of a violation of campaign law, of campaign finance law, correct? I mean, that's what we're talking yeah. about here. Precisely. And so in the original in the original interview of Gary Shapley earlier in the spring, he referenced in there a possible campaign finance spinoff investigation. And there, that, that was ambiguous from the transcript. But now I think the whistleblowers have provided quite a bit more information, you know, including in the September batch of documents, the interview transcript of James Biden, Joe Biden's brother, saying that he remembers when Kevin Morris just showed up out of nowhere and was immediately paying off these bills and how Hunter after these first payments were made right in the middle of the first primaries, the Iowa caucuses, Biden performs poorly and, and uh, Hunter is facing both the paternity case down in Arkansas, the child support case being asked to provide his taxes, yeah. as well as other kind of legal peril because his ex-wife, because he, Hunter hadn't paid his taxes, it was threatening her ability to get a, a, a passport. And uh, so she, this is all in the information that was released just this week. And so she was also threatening uh, to make more of this information public. So all this is coming at a time that's really key for Joe Biden as he's going through these. But before the time of Super Tuesday or South Carolina and Super Tuesday, when things really turned around for him in the primaries, these things were paid off. That threat was kind of eliminated. And so the James Biden transcript shows how in March of 2020, Hunter sent James a message and said, hey, this guy Hunter Morris, or sorry, Kevin Morris, who James, again, was, was really wondering where it came from. Please tell him, please thank him on behalf of the family. Again, they wanted to show all the support and appreciation they could from all these members of the family. And and the whistleblowers, the investigators, thought that was very significant as they were investigating. Hey, if Alvin Bragg can go after Donald Trump for a Stormy Daniels non-disclosure agreement, some prosecutor can go after the Bidens for this Kevin Morris arrangement for millions of dollars in the midst of the 2020 campaign. 
I, I feel I could I feel another scandal just exploding into full view this week. Well, we'll know more tonight. Uh, apparently, if that transcript comes out. In the meantime, Tristan Levitt, thank you very much for all of your hard work on this story. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Prince. Good to talk to you.